I'm Kathy Wang, Senior Director of Security at GitLab. Thank you very much for taking the time to come to listen to GitLab's journey on zero trust today. And this is my colleague, Philippe, and um, we're going to talk to you about zero trust. So what I want to do, since this is an intermediate level talk, is make sure everyone is on the same page with what we mean by zero trust. And then we want to talk about the specific problems that we face um, at GitLab that we were trying to address with zero trust rollout, which is one of our biggest initiatives this year in 2019. And then, of course, I'll talk about the roadmap and how we came about building this. And I definitely want you to be able to learn from our experience so far and take this home with you um, as you build your zero trust journey. So lessons learned will also be a part of our talk. Traditionally, what do we do as security practitioners? We set up a perimeter-based defense system. Right? That's our defense in depth that most of this security industry does. And we all know this really well. It's the hard on the outside and soft on the inside kind of architecture, where if an attacker gets access inside your environment, they can move laterally, they can persist, they can you know, elevate privileges, they can do all of these things. And we know as an industry this does not really work that well but most of us employ this type of architecture anyway. So what I want to highlight is, you know, so why zero trust, right? So Google has a flavor of zero trust that they've built um, back in what, early 2010s, and they call it Beyond Corp. So if you want to read more about that, they have a ton of white papers, great websites with content, um, this is their flavor of zero trust. I'm using the term zero trust because every environment has different requirements. In our case, and in most people's case, what zero trust means is that all devices that are trying to access an endpoint or asset in your environment needs to be authenticated and authorize as they do so. The user has to be verified, validated. We have to know what department or what role they have. And then we can decide whether they should get access to what they're trying to access. All of these decisions, by the way, are dynamic. They're risk-based. So it depends on the sensitivity of the data on the host that they're trying to access. So for example, if I use my personal device to try to access a production level database that has customer data in it, and customer data is high sensitivity, that decision should be a no. Right? You cannot do that. You have to use some sort of corporate managed device to access that, and you have to be in the right role. You have to be someone who should have access to the production DB. There's somewhat a lot of um, confusion about what zero trust is. This year at RSA, how many people went to RSA? Okay, so a smattering of people. Um, they did a really hilarious video, you've got to look this up, where they went around RSA and they asked people, just random people, what is zero trust? What's your definition of it? Half the people didn't know what it was, right? I don't know if this is a surprise to you, but it kind of is to me, because zero trust is one of the top three buzz phrases at RSA this year. So how does that add up? I don't know. But um, this is great video, it's hilarious. So what I want to do here is I want to define what zero trust is not, just in case. If you think you can buy a single product on the market, slap that into your environment, and now you've got zero trust, you're wrong. And if vendors tell you that, they're wrong. Okay, this is not a product that you could just put in. 
um, it's a process. You have to build many components, and those components and how they're built is going to vary depending on your environment, what your users are uh, situated as, and what your requirements are, and what kind of data you're trying to protect. The other common misconception about zero trust is that it's new. Um, that's certainly how it came across at RSA this year, right? The reality is that it's not new. Way back in 2005, and maybe even before that, there were working groups of security practitioners that had already met, talked about their problems, like we always do. We love to talk about our problems with security and figured out that, hey, we have to figure out how to de-perimeterize our environments because this particular crunchy on the outside and soft on the inside kind of model, who is that working for, right? Pretty much no one. So it's not a new concept. It's been talked about before. Usually, companies that implement zero trust do it after a major breach has already occurred. That's kind of the reality of it. And for cloud native companies, of which GitLab is definitely a cloud native company, 80% of these companies have not implemented zero trust or even started on the process. 20% have, and usually after a major breach. So I, I'm not, you know, so what I'm saying is that um, at GitLab, we're trying to implement this before a major breach. So what are the benefits to having zero trust? I think it's pretty clear, so I'm not going to go ahead and read all of these out to you. You can read it yourself. But fundamentally, you just need to understand that this changes the, the model that traditionally we deploy of perimeters. And we define basically every endpoint in our environment as a separate perimeter. That's the idea. So what happens when an attacker gains access to one of your user's credentials? Well, you have multi-factor authentication in place. Maybe a hardware token, for example and that will make the credentials a whole lot less useful for the attacker by themselves. Um, what will happen when attackers do get access to one of the hosts in your environment? Which, you know, we all know in security, and this has been evolving for the 20 years that I've been doing security myself, it's not um, whether you will get compromised or not, many places do get compromised. It's about being transparent about what's happening, making sure your customers know. And then the other thing is about how you recover from that incident. That's very important. So what attackers will do is try to move laterally into your environment once they get in. And zero trust will make that a lot more challenging. So what we're going to see is many more targeted attacks, and it's going to have to be very targeted. It's going to take a lot of resources. Um, I'm not going to sit up here and tell you that zero trust is 100% secure, because then I would be lying, because security is never 100%. But you have to understand it's an ongoing process. A couple of caveats. I want to make sure that everyone knows this. You can't build zero trust in a month or in a week. Um, it is a journey. It probably will take you at least nine to 12 months to do. And that's assuming that you have all of the corporate backing that you need to do that, right? Um, that's also part of it. I will go into a lot more detail about that later. And everything that I'm going to talk about today, all the components that we considered at GitLab as part of our journey, is not the totality of everything you're going to consider for your zero trust journey. Because you will have a different environment. Your users will be different. What you're trying to protect will be different. Um, so learn from us. 
but don't think that this is all there is to it. So let me go into now, before we started on the zero trust journey and deciding how we're going to roadmap and build this out, what did we have in place already at GitLab? And to give you a little bit more background about the security team at GitLab, I joined GitLab about a year and a half ago. And at the time that I joined, there wasn't a formal security team. Right? So think about that for a second. A year and a half ago, there wasn't a security team. So um, now we have a team of almost 30. This helps a lot, of course, but it's been a journey just to get there also. Um, so I don't know how big your security teams are, but you know, that's a factor. So what we had already, one of the first things that I set out to build was a data classification policy. And why is that important? Because it's going to govern what data is being processed or stored in your environment and what levels of sensitivity they are. Right? So for example, for us, customer data is of highest priority. That's going to be in a red data bucket. And we bucketize the data types by red, orange, yellow, and green. So from there, we know as we build out our environment and our zero trust component, where to focus on first, right? Focus on the red data first. That's the highest sensitivity. So having that policy in place and having that blessed by everybody at the company is a great step forward. We also built a Google Cloud security guidelines policy. And what that means is, you know, we have an infrastructure team at GitLab that builds GitLab.com, and they ensure the availability of GitLab.com, which is our SaaS product. And we have 2 million plus users on GitLab.com. How do they build that environment? Are they following security best practices? Are they using VPCs, for example, to compartmentalize different environments? Are they you know, providing access correctly and to best practices guidelines? To me, a policy is just a piece of paper unless we actually enforce it. So we use tools like Google for SETI, for example, to enforce the GCP security guidelines portion of it. We also built an internal acceptable use policy because our users should know what's expected behavior and what's not okay behavior, right, in our environments. Um, basically, here are the rules to play, right, in GitLab.com, in our production environment. Without that, people do whatever and you have to rely on good intentions, and that's, that's never a good idea. We also have a HR database in place, and I mentioned this because part of zero trust components is making sure you know who's who, and what organization they're in, and what role they're in, and what access they should have based on that role. So until you know this, you cannot make that risk-based decision that I was talking about earlier. One thing that's very special to GitLab, and I, I don't know how many people in here work at a 100% remote company, but what that means is um, people are connecting from 50 plus different countries around the world. We don't have a physical building at GitLab. That's a very, very special requirement in our case that may or may not apply to you. But what that means as a security practitioner to me is that I really have to focus on credential and access management of those users. I can't monitor their home networks. I can't monitor the cafes that they're connecting from. There's no physical office that everyone's coming into or VPN into that environment first before accessing anything. That's, that doesn't work that way. So we have to think about that portion of it. We don't do any self-hosting of any services. A lot of companies run their own email servers. We don't even do that, right? We use uh, G Suite, we use Google uh, Gmail, and we rely on Google's security best practices to help make sure, you know, for example, Google Enterprise has a DLP feature 
So for sensitive documents, we might be able to update DLP information to say, hey, don't allow any document with these keywords to be able to be sent out to the public, for example. Um, so we have to rely on third-party SaaS providers for everything. We don't self-host. We also have an environment where everyone is using Mac OS and Linux. We don't have Windows in the environment. Um, you may, so your mileage is going to vary if you do because there's different requirements there and different OSs to deal with. Um, so we have a fairly homogeneous environment, I would call it, from a security standpoint. Now that I've told you what we had in place already, let's talk about the first problem that we're looking to solve. Um, it's going to be a series of three problems. I'll talk about the first and the third, and Philippe will talk about the second. But the first problem is managing those users. Right? We're, as I said, we're connecting from all over the world. So how exactly do we know who they are, what they're trying to access, uh, what type of device are they using to access that, and is it okay for them to access that data? So um, we set out to answer a series of questions in considering this problem. We looked at endpoints. We, we need to know not just the endpoints, meaning the laptop, the user laptops or devices, but the endpoints in our production environment and you know, um, things that we manage on our own in uh, Google Cloud, for example. And so we looked at tools like Optics and Collide because we're a Linux and Mac OS shop. See, this is why I said this matters. If you're Windows, then you look at other tools potentially. But we looked at these tools, which is based on OS query, which is very important to us to gain awareness of what those endpoints look like. Um, building that information into an asset database is, is key. Right? So um, the other piece of it is who are these people that are trying to connect and should they be able to connect? So having an org chart and an org DB is something that we also have to build. And that's gonna be based off of our HR database. Nice. We also want to, we're growing so fast as a company that when I joined a year and a half ago, I was probably employee number 200 something. And now there's over 500 people a year and a half later. And in another year, we're anticipating over 1,000. So think about this from a security management standpoint. Um, you have people onboarding and offboarding every week, like a lot of people, potentially. And a big security risk is to have people leave the company and then still not be updated in your, your database. Right? Think about how scary that would be. Um, that's really not ideal. So being able to onboard, offboard, um, get people access to the third-party apps that they need access to to do their work. Um, we looked at solutions like Okta, Duo, Google Cloud Identity. Uh, these are all solutions that you would consider when you're thinking about this problem. We also looked at that multi-factor authentication piece. In our case, we considered hardware tokens. Right, that makes credential theft less valuable to an attacker. So we considered UB keys, we considered Google Titan security keys. Um, so these are all pieces that you should also look at. And how are we effectively enforcing our data classification policy? It goes back to that, right? Anything that's in a red bucket that is considered most sensitive, we have to protect that first, and that's our highest priority. So these are the types of questions that, that we ask for that. And now we come to problem two, and Philippe will talk to you. Thank you very much, Cathy. Uh, by the way, I'm Philippe Lafoucrière, a distinguished engineer at GitLab. I'm working in the secure team. Uh, we are working on the security features of GitLab, so that's why uh, we are going to uh, talk about securing our applications. 
So we've seen so far all zero trust can help us uh, securing our network perimeter, allowing the admins to uh, set up and enforce policies uh, to protect this network and allow users and devices to access our resources and applications. But it doesn't make any sense if we have these policies in place and attackers can bypass them because we are shipping insecure applications. So how do we trust what's running on our production environment? The first step is to make sure that the applications themselves are secure. In the last year, we have switched left to this, uh, we have switched security to the left at GitLab. That was a huge leap ahead for us, for the, especially for the engineering. Uh, with that, we put the security in the middle of our process. We make sure that the developers are involved and we make sure that we relieve the security team from this burden. With that, we also make sure that we educate the developers. There is no excuse anymore for a developer to say, I didn't know. All the informations are there. The vulnerability is right in the middle of the merge request, so when we want to introduce a new change in our applications and deploy that later, it's there. We have the remediation uh, information directly in the merge request, so the developers can do that themselves. If they don't know how to do that, they can involve the security team, but only when, when needed. With that, we are leaving some space and some room for the security team to work on the very hot topics, the, the ones that are not obvious, the, not the longing fruits that our tools are able to, to catch and to provide. For every commit that we push for our applications, we are going to run security checks. We are going to do SAS dependency scanning, container scanning, binary authorization that we are going to see after that, uh, dynamic application security testing. We're doing the whole package for every commit. So again, the developers, they have the information. They know exactly what's going on and they know the implications of their changes on the production environment. We want to be able also uh, this year to add IAST and fuzzing. Uh, if you want to take a look at the roadmap, there is a link at the bottom of this slide. You can also reach out to us. We are an open core company. We are completely transparent. Our roadmap is public. You can check out that directly online. Um, so our application is not secure. How can we trust what we're going to deploy? For that, we are using binary authorization, which is a, a container security feature uh, that provides a policy enforcement, a policy enforcement choke point to ensure only signed and authorized images can be deployed in production. With that, we want to remove completely the human from the deployment process so that the pipeline will be the one and only way to create images and deploy images. The signature is going to happen directly in the pipeline phase. For that, we are relying on a Google feature named binary authorization. And under the hood, binary authorization is relying on Graphias and Critis. Graphias is the service to annotate the images, and Critis is the service to uh, enforce the, the policies and uh, checking the signatures. We are going to use that to annotate the images that we will deploy to production, for example, with the results of the security checks. And if we find that some vulnerabilities are still shipping in this image, we can block the deployment directly with Critis, so with uh, the Google binary authorization. This is something that is upcoming really soon, and we're dogfooding, obviously, at GitLab. We're using GitLab to develop GitLab, so we're, we're going to use that ourselves uh, really soon. So I told you that the pipeline is going to sign the image. So that means the pipeline has the, the right keys, the required keys, and only the pipeline has these keys. So that means we need to be able to trust where we store these keys. For that, we are using another Google feature named Google KMS, the Google Management, the key, Google Key Management Service. Uh, this service is not available for all the users. Only particular users and particular services, like the pipeline, are able to request keys. Uh, we only have JKMS activated on production environment right now, but we plan to have that on more environments in the future. So know that our deployment chain is secure, our application is secure, the deployment is secure. You know, uh, accuracy are a bit like life, they always find a way, and they can compromise our user accounts. Even if everything is secure, they can always use one of a user's account if they manage to. So how do we mitigate that? We can't prevent that, obviously, but we can't limit the impact of this, uh, these compromisations. For that, we are using user 
and entity behavior analytics. It's, uh, again, a security feature, but based this time on machine learning and data analysis, we're going to analyze all the logs, all the events, all the, all the actions on our platform and our environment. And we will do that to look for the unknown unknowns, the suspicious. So for example, if we have developers working on a weekly basis, they work from Monday to Friday, they are located in the US, and suddenly on a Saturday morning, 3 a.m., we have a connection, we have a Git commit coming from Russia, from China at 3 a.m. It's really suspicious. We need to be able to, um, to catch this, to notify the security team, and to make sure that we're going to do further, inf uh, further investigation and eventually block the account. So this is how we we'll remediate that. All of these features are available on GitLab. We are, again, dogfooding. Uh, this is going to be part of something that we call GitLab Defend. And again, you can uh, check out the links that are there if you want to see what's uh, upcoming uh, in the roadmap this year. Put that back to you, Gary. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Philippe. So now that Philippe has talked to you about securing our applications, I want to talk to you about the third problem that we had to face here, um, which is securing GitLab.com, which is our infrastructure. At GitLab, this environment acts as both our environment and customer data environment, right? We use GitLab at work, and this is part of our dog fooding process. And it's very important to us culturally to do that, uh, dog food and contribute to the product. GitLab.com is where over two million users have GitLab accounts. So we want to make sure that there's trust built in that, that people trust that we're protecting their sensitive data in the repos. Um, so what kind of information do we need to know and what questions do we need to ask there? One thing is making sure that we always know, have full awareness of vulnerability management of our endpoint devices in production. So we looked at solutions like Tenable.io in our case, um, just making sure that that information is always there. And who owns what? in the environment. Because we dog food all of our own stuff, that means that engineers, developers are setting up their own environments for testing or for whatever purpose. And so it becomes even more imperative for us to know what those are, who owns that, who should have access to that. So I mentioned optics earlier. And again, this is a very useful tool, if you haven't looked into it, uh, based on OS query for that. We want to make sure that we can mitigate DDoS attacks and other types of abuse type attacks on GitLab.com. So for, to that end, we looked at WAFs, right, like Fastly, Cloudflare, for example. Um, that's something that we have to do specific to GitLab.com. And then if an attacker were to gain access, how do we make it more difficult for them to move laterally? And by using VPCs, we can compartmentalize each environment in a more clean way. And then we can use other tools to enforce any violations to those access that's coming from one environment to another. And what we've done is basically um, when those tools run, like for SETI's results, will come into Slack, we use Slack, and uh, basically do chat ops to report violations. And now the security operations team can act on those violations and alerts. And then how do we secure our environment using Google's security best practices? This is something that Google's security research team has thought about for a really long time. Um, they're considered to be leaders in this area, for sure. And we want to be able to definitely use their knowledge about security best practices in Google Cloud to secure our own environment. So we looked at tools like Cloud Security Command Center. Um, that's an ongoing process. We turn it on. We're evaluating right now how that works for us also. 
And then we, like I said earlier, a policy isn't that useful if you don't enforce it. Um, if you don't enforce it, you're relying on users' good intentions, and, and we know how that goes, right? So uh, people are human, they make mistakes, and that's just putting it in a nice way, right? So um, now that I've talked to you, and Philippe has talked to you about the top three problems that we were looking to solve with our zero trust implementation, let's talk about road mapping. So since zero trust is such a big topic and it's not something you can build right away, it takes a long time, it's a process. Um, my understanding is that Google is still building beyond Corp. You know, so it's a really big project. So how do you wrap your head around where to get started? Well, when I started, it was like, Okay, so there's so many components. How do I exactly want to bucketize that? So what I did was I worked with my team and decided that we're going to do it in three buckets. Right? The first bucket is anything that will touch, store, process customer data and is managed by us. So that means our gitlab.com infrastructure, right? anything in there, um, things like that. So that's one of our buckets that we put components into. The other bucket is endpoints. Employee laptops, devices that are being used to access this environment, GitLab.com, production environment, that are um, individually managed. That goes into the endpoint bucket. So every component that goes towards securing that goes into this bucket. The third bucket, I mentioned that we don't self-host anything. We rely on third-party SaaS vendors also. So anything that does not store or process customer data, and that includes like third-party apps that we use at GitLab, like uh, Slack, like um, Zoom, like Salesforce, like other you know, third-party apps, goes into this bucket. So that's how I began to wrap my head around exactly how we're going to compartmentalize this. So based on those three buckets, I realized that, hey, there's no reason why we have to create a roadmap where it's kind of done in serial. For each bucket, I'm gonna have different components that apply to that bucket. It's okay to build these out in parallel. Right? That's actually more efficient. It saves you more time. You can get to the journey faster. And so that's how we decided to roadmap this out. I'm not going to read the whole roadmap for you. You can see for yourself. But the point of laying it out this way, that's very important to you know, make sure you take home with you, is things can be built in parallel once you bucketize how it's going to be. So now that I've talked about how we began to put the roadmap together and start building these components out, let's talk about lessons learned so far. I mean, obviously, we're not totally done building Zero Trust. We started, and we have some components in place, but it's going to be a while before we're completely you know, at the point where I would call done and then maintaining, right? First thing to remember, it's an ongoing exercise. You're always gonna get new users, new devices, new endpoints. Every single time that happens, that information needs to be updated in your databases, in, in your decision process. Who gets access to what and with what device? That's always ongoing. Build each roadmap independently, but figure out what buckets you're going to have first. That will be the most efficient process to use. We figured out while putting the roadmap together that there are certain components like centralized single sign-on that if you get that in place first earlier on in the roadmap, some of the other pieces that follow will be more easily facilitated because of the presence of that. Um, so think about things that way as well as you put numbers on the different components in your roadmap. What should you do first so that 
what follows is more easily put in place. There's an element of user experience that a lot of people don't realize or talk about with building out zero trust. You need to make sure you don't impede business processes. Right? I mean, if you have zero trust in place, but people can't get their work done, that's going to be a big no. And as a security practitioner and a security team, you'll be under a lot of fire for that kind of thing. Right? So think about the user experience as you go along. In our case, we um, decided to go with Okta for single sign-on solution. And that really, really helped facilitate the onboarding and offboarding process. And our, our sales and our marketing teams, they were really happy with that because they have so many third-party apps that they use that they didn't want to like sign in to each one individually, right, um, separately. It made for a really, really good user experience right off the start. It helps to build user trust, which will then help you be able to roll out other components later on, which may introduce more friction in the day-to-day -day work process. You know, I'm not going to sit up here and tell you security never introduces friction. It does. Um, but the idea is to minimize it, make sure people trust what you're doing, and they will if they have a positive experience at the beginning. And then, you know, you can introduce other parts of it. But always think about that as a security practitioner. We realize that there's serious automation work that needs to be done to make these risk-based decisions. Data has to be pulled from uh, org DB, asset DB, all of this um, components to be able to make a decision on whether this access is allowed or not. So I do have a team of security automation engineers on my security team. And this is what they work on, how to automate all of these pieces. And that helps us scale. And it's important to scale because we're going to grow to over 1,000 employees this year. And I can't imagine these decision processes being manual. Uh, it shouldn't be. Your mileage is going to vary. As I mentioned earlier, you can't buy one product, slap it in. Now you got zero trust. You have different requirements, most likely. Maybe you're not 100% remote. Maybe 50% of your employees come to a physical office every day. So one size does not fit all. And as I mentioned earlier, Google's Beyond Corp is a flavor of zero trust. It's a really good learning experience to read all of the white papers that they have. Um, it's really great. But you know, at the end of the day, they're Google. They have a different environment than what we had. So we couldn't do exactly the same thing. Right? It just doesn't work. One size does not fit all. And I want to also emphasize that for some of you who maybe come from more mature environments where the company's been around for 20 years, for example, and perimeter-based protections are already put in place, it may be more of an uphill battle for you to, to you know, lobby for zero trust. I mean, everyone wants it, and everyone knows that it's a good model. Not perfect, nothing is. But you may face more resistance because people don't like ripping up what's already there. Right? That's, that's difficult. So that's um, maybe a political battle for you. You know, in GitLab's case, because we're, we're growing so fast, a year and a half ago, we didn't have a formal security team. Things are different. So I want to make sure that you know that. 